some in terms of individual people, great things they did, things they did that changed history. President Kennedy had this expression. He said, human history is a sum of countless acts of individual courage. And that drill instructor taught that to me that day. And the way he taught it was so interesting, because he said, these people who did these things before you, they weren't just uh, born with some, some great skill set you would never have. They were just lucky they were born a hero. You could never be that. He said, if you learn these things here, if you develop that commitment to these things bigger than yourself, you can be one of them someday. You can walk amongst them. And I was so honored with that. I was so proud to just be part of this. I believed in it. And so I, I got very committed to that. And then when I got out of the Fleet Marine Force, I worked for a non-commissioned officer when I first got out there. And he kind of put it a little more real world to me. He said, Bob, he said, it's about, this job is about being the 0400 Marine, he used to call it. He said, anybody can sit out here in the middle of a sunshiny day and talk about courage, honor, commitment, service. That's easy. Anybody can do it. That real deal guy is at 1 4 in the morning. And he's cold, tired, wet, wounded, up against the wall. The one who believes in men, that's a real deal guy. That's who you want to be. So I, I was amazed with this. And I spent all my time always trying to train. Looking for these zero four moments, figuring I gotta be ready for these. Always ready for that time when my number's called, when it's my time to shine. I gotta be ready for that. I was fortunate, I got to serve the first Marine Division a good bulk of my time. I was very privileged to be part of the, the initial invasion of Iraq and the march up to Baghdad. Now we did that, the big unknown were the Iraqi civilians. Nobody knew what they were gonna do. Were they gonna shoot at us around every corner? Were they gonna embrace us as Liberators, nobody knew. So our commanding general gave us his guidance. He said, Marines, be no better friend, no worse enemy. If they embrace you as a, as a friend, be the best friend they've ever had. Help them with whatever they need. And if they fight with you, fight with them so ferociously they never want that to ever happen again. And so this was good guidance. I love this part of this mission because I love the, I love the fact that every Iraqi civilian who would come after me, would base their opinion of all the Americans who would follow me on my interaction with them. If I represented my nation, my core well, they would, everything would be good. If I represented bad, things would be bad for the people who would follow me. So I loved that whole part. I loved everything about it. When we got to Baghdad, there was a part of this, this a very transformative moment in my life that I wanted to share with you. Now, when we got to the city, the civilians just disappeared. They all went, they hid. And it's, it's an understandable thing to them. They had Americans in their capital city. They had Marines moving through their capital. They knew their life was getting ready to change. And they didn't know for better or for worse. So they did what logical people would do. And they hid. They went underground. They just hid. They waited to see what was going to happen next. And we did what, what we do. We just kept taking ground because there was no resistance at that point. And we got to downtown Baghdad. And there's a place in the middle of the city there called Ferdo Square. And it's great Iraqi logic, because it's actually a circle, but they call it Ferdo Square for whatever reason. <laughs> and in the middle of the square there, they've got a big statue of Saddam Hussein standing like this. It's a big 40-foot statue of him. Now to us, that didn't mean anything. It was meaningless. But to the Iraqi people, these were all very symbolic things, because you couldn't go down any street in Iraq back then and not find a mural of Saddam. You couldn't go into any room and there not be a picture of him somewhere. Every town had a statue to him. And they were warnings to the people. Because he was a dictator. And these were warnings. You don't speak out. You don't do anything out of line in this current, under this dictatorship. If you do, secret police come and they pull you away. Take your family away, whatever. So to them, these were symbols to keep the people in line. To us, it was nothing. It was just, because was, we don't do that here. To us, it was just somewhere to set a defense. So we encircled it with our tanks to the Iraqi civilians just took on a strange symbolism. They saw this image that they've been taught, they've been raised in fear, and now it's surrounded by Americans. And as with all great things, it started with one individual. One man said, you know what, maybe we can trust these people. And he walked out, and he was met with the handshake of a friend. Now, not the barrel of a rifle, not the butt of a rifle, but a handshake. And the others saw this, and they got emboldened by that. And they started coming out, twos, fours, dozens, hundreds. And before long, we had this party happening in downtown Baghdad. They started celebrating the arrival of Americans. 
And they turned their attention to that statue of Saddam that they had to fear up until our arrival. And they started trying to knock it down. And they did, but they just had primitive hand tools like sledgehammers. They were never going to get that statue down. It was humongous. It's 40 foot tall. And then again, all great things start with one person. A kid walked up to one of our vehicles and said, Mr. Mister, can you help us tear down the statue? Now the vehicle he walked up to was what we call an M88 uh, tank retriever. It's like a tow truck for the tanks. Got a 1500 horsepower engine, big winch on the front, 90 ton winch for pulling out tank engines. Also ideally suited for pulling down statues. So there they go, they roll on out there, they noose up old Saddam. The Marina went up there, many of you may have seen this on TV, some of you may have been there. The Marina went up there, his name was Kropaletti Chin. Kropaletti Chin was a tank mechanic, he was the son of a Burmese immigrant. His family, his father moved his family here to this nation in search of liberty. And there was Eddie Chin up on top of that boom, new subsidized, becoming a symbol of liberty for the entire world. So they pulled out the statue of Saddam, and the people rejoiced. The people went nuts. And I was looking at this, and it, it, it hit me what I was looking at. I realized I was seeing liberty. I was seeing freedom. At its most grassroots level, people who'd never known a day's freedom their entire life and, and were now getting their first taste of it. And I was, I was in my late 30s at that point, and I'd never known a day in my life without it. I'd never had a day in my entire life that was their daily life every day before we got there. And I was so proud. It did me down there in downtown Baghdad. I realized just how special it was what had, what had happened here before, before I was even born. I was born in 1967 when those Vietnam veterans, I think there's probably some in the room, when those Vietnam veterans were all fighting the spread of communism in Vietnam. Before that, those Korean War vets were stopping the spread of communism on that Korean peninsula. That greatest generation before that, stopping those totalitarian regimes and coming back and building the greatest economy the world would ever know. And I was so proud of this whole thing. I was so proud of just just to even be part of this, to be part of a, a, a military that does these sorts of things, that safeguards freedom to the point that not only do we, do we take care of it for ourselves, we take it halfway around the world to people who've never even known it before. And I was, I was so proud of this. I, you don't get to pick what you do in the military, but if you'd asked me to pick, I'd have picked doing exactly what, I, what, what my nation had me doing. Now we all know, here we are almost 20 years later, that knocking down statues didn't free a nation. And there was to be a lot of heavy lifting ahead. The following year, I found myself in a place called Fallujah. And I had another transformative moment I just want to share with you real quickly. I was out on a road, I was out on a, uh, what we call a vehicle control point. It's a fancy way of saying I had my tank parked in the middle of the street, blocking traffic. A vehicle comes up on me. I got down, I greeted him, he got out. He, you know, we meet each other in the street with a handshake, and he told me he's the mayor of Fallujah. And he wanted to meet with my battalion commander. So I called my battalion commander. He's coming out there to meet with this gentleman. This gentleman's nervous because we're just standing up a new democracy in that country. Standing up a new democracy, a new police force, a new military. <coughs> Excuse me. And here he was out there. And he's very nervous. He's got a bodyguard. Just a man armed with a pistol. Now, Fallujah at that time was a very dangerous place. There was a lot of rocket and machine gun fights at pistol range. Very dangerous. This guy's got a pistol. That's it. And this mayor. So I called my battalion commander. He's coming out to meet with them. This mayor says something to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, well, how long is he going to take? Because he's on the way. It's going to take him a while to get there. He says, if he takes much longer, somebody's going to kill me out here. And I thought, what courage. What faith. What belief this man must have. That he, he, that he thinks I'm going to stand beside him. He believes I will stand with him. That he believes that my nation is going to stand beside him throughout this fight. Because we all talk about people that will plant trees that they'll never sit under the shade of. He was going to be one of those people. He was likely to die in the battle that was going to happen, that was going to follow that. He would never experience his freedom that he was giving his life for to, in, his, in, his, in his nation. And I looked at that bodyguard, that man armed with a pistol. Because that's more like the job I did. And I thought, what guts? Because the enemy over there fights dirty. They'll come after his family while he's out training. And I thought, what belief, what vision he must have for, for a future that he's probably never going to live to see. 
and I was so proud to just fight alongside these two men. He would have his meeting with my battalion commander. Things would turn south in the city of Fallujah shortly thereafter. They would uh, end up killing four American contractors, stringing their bodies up like garbage from a train trestle. And now we went into that no worse enemy part. Now we went into fight, and we were going to uh, fight a very vicious uh, battle with them. We got a room full of trigger pullers here. I'm not going to tell you any war stories. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to bore you with that stuff, any of my little stuff. But I'll tell you, when it came time for this newly stood up Iraqi army to come fight by our side, 20 of them showed up. <laughs> and my Marines were mad. They were looking at me. They were like, that's it, buddy? 20 of these guys? <laughs> and I say, Marines, 20 men who want to pick up a rifle and fight for their freedom, I'll fight with them. They said, we will too, buddy. And because our nation stood beside those 20, those 20 turned into 200, turned into 2,000, turned into 20,000, turned into free and democratic elections in a part of the world nobody thought that was going to work because of the commitment. Now in that battle, my life was going to be changed. It was, a, it was a few days into the battle, I was leading an attack in a place called the Jolan District. I was commanding an M1A1 main battle tank, had another tank behind me, and a platoon infantry, and we were doing what we do. I was heading into a cross street about 1 in the afternoon on April 7, 2004. And if you'd asked me going into that cross street, you said, Nick, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I said, I am doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm a career Marine. I'm helping a press field become free. Life don't get no better than this. But life was going to have a change in store for me in that intersection. I went in there. I took my loader. I put him down below the armor line. I had that intersection. I scanned on my right for enemy. It was a very narrow cross street. When I looked, there was an enemy on the rooftop, and he was very close about to the back of the chapter house here from my tank. And he was at a rocket, rocket propelled grenade. He was looking right at the flank of the tank, at the whole side of the tank. He's looking at. And I got to tell you, by this point, I had a pretty healthy disrespect for our enemy's ability to fight. I used to tell my Marines, if they're shooting at you, you're perfectly safe. If they're shooting somebody around you, you might want to get some cover. You, you might get hit by accident. But he's not going to miss. He's real close. He's not going to miss. But this is no problem. And when anyone made battle tanks, the best tank in the world. So I hunger down. He hits the side of my turret. Doesn't penetrate. No problem. I'm getting ready to shoot him with my 50 cal before he gets away. Then I heard a second hiss. Many of you are familiar with that noise. It makes like a snake hiss when it cuts through the air. And then BAM! It felt like I got hit in the head with a sledgehammer. There was a second one, I never saw him. He was to, to my right rear about my four o'clock, and he pulled one right in the hatch. The grenade blew my helmet apart. It blew one eye completely out of my head. It blew the other eye down into my sinus cavity. But all I really knew at the time was to knock me down. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and the more I talk, the more, the more you're gonna figure that, that out. But, the one thing I do know is when you've been knocked down, get up. And the Marine Corps taught me that. So I, I was knocked down, I got up. I couldn't see because both my eyes were not in there, not, not in my head anymore. And, uh, and I felt my head, and it was all wet. It was wet, but I could tell I was bleeding very profusely. What happened, I'd have a shrapnel filled my, my right side of my face and my neck. So I was bleeding pretty badly. So I reached for my second in command, a fellow named Corporal Chambers. And I'm saying, Chambers, Chambers, and I'm looking for him. He's not there. What he did, he saw the gun, he bleed to death on the floor of the turret, and he knew it was the zero four and all stuff for him. And he went up right to the same place. He just seen me get shot in the head. Without hesitation, without waiting to be told what to do it. I went up there to save my life. I looked for that other guy, Fernandez, when I put below the arm line. I couldn't find him either. What he had done, because he knew an attack's like a one-way street. He's got to get up and get back on his machine gun because we got to continue to keep going forward. We can't go back or we're going to put more Marines in jeopardy. He's got to keep pressing on. So I couldn't see these two guys up there, but if I could have seen the two of them, I'd have seen they were both wounded. I couldn't see the top of that turret, but if I could have seen it, I'd have seen it was on fire. And there they were in the middle of those flames, manning those machine guns, fighting to save my life. But they had to get me to a medevac site because I was going to bleed to death very quickly. So they didn't know where it was. Our youngest guy, our tank driver, 19 years old, 
Fallujah was his first firefight. Year before, he was at his high school senior prom. And he said, fellas, I know the way. And it got me that medevac site. I'm alive today because of those three guys at that, at that moment, at that critical moment when I needed them. Now, when they got me to the medevac site, they pulled me off the tank, and then they started applying direct pressure trying to stop the bleeding. And so I could feel the foreman's working on me. And he said, hey, Gunny, Mary, where are you from? You got kids. I know what he's doing.